Hello, everybody, and welcome to Intentioning This Live, a new series of conversations to help you reach your highest intentions. I'm Gloria Felt. I'm co-founder and president of Take the Lead. We're a nonprofit organization whose mission is nothing less than gender parity for all women of all diversities and intersectionalities by 2025. And we do training, coaching, role modeling, and thought leadership to help you get there. I am so excited today to start this series with Linda Hirschman, the author of an amazing new book that you will love. You need to buy it right away because it will you will learn things you never knew about the abolition movement and so much more. This book is called The Color of Abolition. And uh, it, it will it will just it will knock your socks off. I'm just going to tell you that it's uh, Linda is a, a woman who has studied both the women's movement and the abolition movement and so many other movements. She knows she's a student of movements in general. So her perceptions are are extraordinary. And uh, this new book, The Color of Abolition, How a Printer, a Prophet, and a Contessa Moved a Nation is just fantastic. She's also the author of Reckoning, the epic battle for uh, the epic, ba epic battle against sexual abuse and harassment, uh, and uh, Sisters-in-Law about the two first women on the United States Supreme Court and their relationship, which is a fabulous book as well. And in addition to that, Victory, the epic gay rights uh, uh, success. I can't, I didn't get the name of that right. I know that. Triumphant, something like that, right? Triumphant gay rights movement. I think I got it now. Anyway, the other things about Linda that I can tell you are that she's, you know, by, by training a lawyer, she's a professor, she's an opera lover, she's a knitter. Uh, also, she makes the best cherry soup you ever had in your life. So please welcome <laughs> Linda Hirschman. And I want to start, Linda, by asking you something that you say in the description of the book. And it is when you when you talk about the alliance among Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and Maria Weston Chapman. And by the way, why have we never heard of Maria Weston Chapman until your book, or at least I hadn't, and I thought I knew everything about women's history. And you talk about how their coming together was so important and then how they're breaking apart was actually what led to the success of the abolition movement. So with that, tell us, what does that mean? It sounds very paradoxical. It is paradoxical. And part of it is just faith, right? Um, what happened was the abolitionist movement had split into two parts before Frederick Douglass actually came on the scene. He was still... Uh, he was out of slavery. He had escaped from Maryland in 1838, a couple of years after he got out. But before he became an activist, the movement split. And it split for many reasons. But the biggest reason, in retrospect, is that the Boston branch, led by William Lloyd Garrison, the printer of my title, um, believed that you could only abolish slavery through moral suasion. You had to persuade people to be opposed to slavery. And if you couldn't persuade the slave power in the South to abolish slavery, then you had to persuade the North to secede. No union with slaveholders was their motto. So, and on the other side, the New York, led by the New Yorkers, the New York branch and the upstate New York branch, believed that you could take political action and end slavery as a matter of legislation and litigation, the two things that Americans do to change things through political action. And the movement had split. When Douglas got out of slavery, his people from the Underground Railroad, David Ruggles and people like that from the Underground Railroad who were really managing his escape, sent him to New Bedford, Massachusetts, because it was a safe-ish place for a fugitive slave to live. The people there looked out for slave catchers and, <clears throat> and protected their Black citizens. So he went to New Bedford, Massachusetts. And when he was in New Bedford, um, he became a subscriber to the Liberator newspaper, Garrison's newspaper. Mm -hmm. And a Quaker, remember, when you think about the abolition of slavery, the Quakers are often front and center. So Quaker, William Coffin, heard 
Douglas speak about his experiences in slavery at his little black church in New Bedford. And Coffin, being a Massachusetts person, was part of the Boston moral half of the movement. So he took Frederick Douglass and introduced Douglass to Garrison and the Boston part, faction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Douglass um, signed on with them that night, that summer night in 1841, after they first heard him speak, they had the good sense to sign him up to be a <laughs> lecturer for their movement. So he signed up with the Garrison branch of abolition and formed an alliance with Garrison and Garrison's number one manager, the person you've never heard of, Maria Weston Chapman, and they made the alliance. If Douglas had gone to New York or if he had first been introduced to the New York branch, maybe my story would be a very different one. But they stayed together. Douglas stayed with the moralistic, no politics branch of the abolitionist movement for almost a decade, right? He began to drift away from them seven or eight years after he ar arose in 1841, but the final breach was not until 1853. So it was almost more than a decade. And at that point, Douglas went right into the arms of the New York branch, the mm. political branch. And of course, it turned out they were right, right? So that the, the split between the moralists and the politicos, it was about substance and it was a substantive argument. And history has proven that the political branch of abolition was had the right idea. Well, don't we need both, though, Linda? I mean, don't, doesn't a movement need both of those, moral suasion and political action? Totally. And it's really important to know, if you look, and I actually did this, it was so interesting. If you look at the politicians who came to the fore of abolition in the late 1840s and 1850s in the run-up to the Civil War, you will see that almost all of them at some point crossed paths with the moral branch of the abolitionist movement. The Garrison branch had a lecture corps led by Theodore Weld. Weld touched everybody who ultimately went to Congress and stuff and formed the political branch. So that is 100% correct. And the radical moralists of the uh, moral branch of abolition kept the pol politicians feet to the fire. So they were a constant present in keeping the Republicans, who the good guys at that time, the Republicans were the good guys at that time, um, in keeping the Republicans radical and keeping the radical branch of the Republican Party, which was the abolitionist party, uh, radical. So you absolutely need both. But Garris, and you know, I don't think that the politicians were opposed to the moralistic arguments. They made moral arguments, but the moralists were opposed to the political action. I see. So I when Douglas drifted into politics, unsurprisingly, right, for this black fugitive slave, abolition was not an self, a personal indulgence. It was the heart of the matter. And so when he saw that there was a way that you could make traction in abolishing slavery, he went over to the people that were making traction. But um, they and the moralists were angry with him and ultimately they pushed him out. But I don't think the feeling went so much the other way. So tell the story of Maria. Tell her story. <laughs> so. Maria Weston Chapman is, as I keep telling my friends in the movie business, the perfect starring role for a, a female actor. Um, she was beautiful, she was wealthy, and she was gorgeously dressed. Um, when she walked into her first anti-slavery meeting in 1834, the people at the meeting who had been sort of marginal, right? We know what marginal activists look and feel like. They looked at this gorgeous, beautifully dressed woman and thought she was a spy. <laughs> so um, it's a very romantic part, right? She grew up dependent on her uh, ancestral family. And uh, her mother's brother, Uncle Joshua, had gone to London and made a lot of money. He was one of the founders of the Bering 
brother's bank, a big financial institution. And when she got to be 18, he brought her to London and she spent a couple of years in fancy private school in London. And when she came back to Boston, trailing an ineffable European air, she was catnip for the guys. And she attracted um, the attention of Henry Grafton Chapman, the son of a Boston Brahmin shipping family. But unusually the Chapmans were abolitionists very early adopters of abolition. So she married into an abolitionist family and that's how she came to abolition. Meanwhile, her cousins, her husband's cousins and her husband's family were reeling in the Westons to abolition. Maria had five sisters and her that was the secret of her success. Um, and I'll talk about that because I, I was thinking about, you know, the, if, if we could, we, your first book, get to work was one which which told women yes you can have all that you want to have basically uh it's it's up to you to make those choices about what you're going to do with your life and and i i i'm also fascinated with reading about how how maria managed to have a number of children and uh and the secret was in fact that she had this extended family of sisters who didn't have children right and who helped her out but no. I, I mean and so these issues we're dealing with today are not new issues, right? They're they certainly are issues. not. They certainly are not new issues. She had it all. She had a brilliant career, as the book retails. She is a really important figure in the most important movement in American history. Hard to wish for more than that. She had what was, to all accounts, a very happy marriage, although he died young, mm -hmm. and she had three children. Uh, one of whom was endlessly aggravating and the other two were fine. Uh, but I think that the, the secret of having it all for Maria was that she had, well, first of all, her husband was not a jerk. She did not violate the first Hirschman rule of marital having it all. She did not marry a jerk. Henry Grafton Chapman died of tuberculosis in 1842. And the last thing he said to her was, I'm leaving you to the movement. Mm, whoa, so, that gives me goosebumps. It is a beautiful story and one that, of course, nobody knows until they read my book because Maria was so neglected. But um, so she did not marry a jerk. She had money. There was money in both her family and her husband's family. Never a drawback. And, um, and she had these sisters who were totally in it with her. And they would take her children to the family farm in Dunham, Massachusetts and raise them for months at a time. Or they would come to Boston and take care of everything when Maria was running the bazaars that were the biggest money-making institutions for the abolition of slavery. So indeed, the sisters were a huge part of her success. I, you know, I think it's a little weird to think that you need five spinster sisters. Right? You really do not want to have, you know, <laughs> your sister um, in order to be successful. And I, I actually think that Maria would have been successful regardless. Uh, no doubt, no doubt. I, I, I was, I was slightly facetious, but there, there are so many. You know, I mean, there's just there's so many parallels. It's like, you know, so so often women today think we are the ones who have the only ones who ever had this issue of trying to to balance children and a career. But this has been going on for a very long time. It has. And it was ultimately the son who was very aggravating, who caused Maria to leave America and leave the abolitionist movement in 1848 and move to Europe. She was trying to get him to a place where he might be less tempted to bad behavior. So at the end, but by then she had done a lot, both for the good and for the bad. So I want to talk about the bad for just a moment, because I noticed that you did talk about how not just Maria, but many of the people in the abolitionist movement, nevertheless, had very racist ideas. Right. The worst. How, how, you know, I mean, from a movement building perspective, I thought, yeah, I mean, that is just one of those things that it's hard to it's hard to change a culture while you're living in it, I always say. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like that people don't realize that there was so much of that underlying racism and yet all of this massive social change. You are wise as usual, Gloria. It's hard to change a culture 
while you're living in it. And many members of the Boston branch of abolition harbored deep racist beliefs, which were prevalent in America and probably in all of European culture, um, even among the, even in the North, right? And even among the abolitionists, as I learned when I looked at their letters. Um, the, the worst of the letters came from Edmund Quincy, who was from the Quincy family, very fancy family in Massachusetts. And uh, they were written to uh, Maria Weston Chapman's sister, Caroline Weston. So I think it's important to know that if you're writing to Caroline Weston, you're writing to Maria Weston Chapman because mm -hmm. those sisters shared everything. And he felt free to say these hateful things to Maria Weston Chapman's sister. Um, Maria Weston Chapman wrote a letter in which she explained Frederick Douglass's disaffection from their movement by saying that he didn't want to work as hard as his white manager. He wasn't hard working enough. So I want to be sure that you understand that Frederick Douglass was on the road for abolition and then for racial equality for something like 50 years went everywhere, sacrificed his family life in many ways. He was the hardest working person you could possibly imagine. So the racism in those letters is a little surprising. Um, but it wasn't even confined to the Boston branch. She would say, well, they're Brahmins and they have this sort of caste system in their background. But in fact, one of the other hateful letters was written by someone from Rochester, New York, where the New York upstate New York branch was centered. So it was pretty prevalent. Okay. And, and you have to, you have to be grateful, so grateful for the people who saw the horizon and were able to get outside of their culture, even while they were in it. And one of them, sadly, was William Lloyd Garrison. He really was one of the least racist members of the Boston branch. And he did not believe, for example, he did not believe in uh, buying the freedom of enslaved people. He thought that that was paying ransom to the enslavers. And he thought if you had that kind of money, you should give it to the abolitionist movement and abolish slavery for everyone. But when Frederick Douglass's British supporters raised a fund to buy his freedom so he would not be in constant danger of being recaptured, Garrison made an exception for Douglass. And he even contributed a little bit to the fund. So Garrison was really pretty good about it. And that's why it was so unbelievably disappointing when, when Douglass defied him and openly embraced the political belief system, he too joined in the attacks on Douglas. You have to be grateful for people who can see your, that's such a beautiful thing, see it even while they're in it. So talk a little bit about the power of the media to affect that change. And particularly, again, if you can also talk about Maria's influence on on, on it because she, I think it sounds like from your book that she wrote more and, and contributed more to what was going out in, in the media than, it, than we knew. It really is so surprising even now. I will say that she was not paid more attention to. I will say this, she I was not intending to write about her. I was intending to write about Garrison and Douglas, the, mm -hmm. inner, the possibility of an interracial alliance. And as I was doing my research, I came across a book by Lee Chambers, who's a feminist scholar, about the Western Sisters, okay? There's a book called The Western Sisters, which shines a light on Newsflash, The Western Sisters. <laughs> um, and included in that book, of course, is Maria Weston Chapman and the story of how the sisters helped her to have it all. Um, but no one had written a book about the incredibly important role that she played in the abolitionist movement. She pops up here and there 
in like there's a book about the or an article about the um boston female anti-slavery society which was the place that she walked into when they thought she was a spy um and she was really important in the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, but there's nothing that focuses on her as a, as a main character. So, uh, and one of the things I learned about her is that um, she made herself the corresponding secretary, a really smart move. She made Ooh, herself the mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so she and and the and of course she got to frame what happened in her own words, right? The person who writes the agenda dictates the meaning. So um, she wrote something called "Right and Wrong" in Boston about the argument between the Garrisonians and the political branch, and the guise of the record of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. And, and so she got to write the record year after year until finally the other women in the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society said, that's not actually what we think is happening, Maria. We're going to take your post away from you. <laughs> but she, <laughs> right, they figured it out, but it took a while, right? She had checked out and still off the records, right? So historians like me, when we go back, right, the person, right, who lives, who dies, who tells the story. So right. she got to tell the right. She got to tell the story. She also okay. wrote. A, she wrote uh, many things for their, uh, for the uh, National Anti-Slavery Standard. She wrote for the Liberator. Um, she wrote poetry. She wrote hymns. She wrote essays. She put together a book of writings from famous people around the country called the Liberty Bell. Right which she beautifully bound and sold at a high price at the bazaars every year. So it was a big money raiser for them. Maria Weston Chapman um, understood the power of media. And um, in my book, I write about it and I'm going to be talking, I'm doing a book talk on behalf of the National Archives. And, um, and yeah, and which are, uh, you know, such a blessing to all of us to have them and have mm -hmm. the resources. So, um, and the role of media in social change. In the particular case of abolition, it was two things. It was three things. There were three things in those two things. The machine printing press, the steam powered printing press. So the printing press went from being something where a little kid like Lloyd Garrison in his apprenticeship years would pull a lever and a sheet of paper would pass across the inked letters or the inked letters would come down on a piece of paper and then it would come up on another piece, right? A few hundred an hour to being driven by rollers, which would roll the ink letters across the paper, mm -hmm. driven mm -hmm. by steam. And that generated 4,000 pages an hour. It was a huge difference to, to increase your output like that. The second thing that made a huge difference was, and this is so wonderful, because it was like the South had the seeds of its own destruction in it. Rag paper, cheap rag paper made from cotton. So when, <laughs> isn't that wonderful? When slaves- That is fabulous. <laughs> I love this. Why? Another Why? wonderful Why? paradox. See? Right. Yeah. And also I mean, about it's, 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 history movement. is full of them. <laughs> exactly. And writing about social movements, you, you get to know where to look. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know always to look at whether there was a change in media technology, like the invention of movable type and the Protestant Reformation is the classic example. So I was looking for this and lo and behold, it turns out that newsprint, which was very expensive before slave cotton got very, very cheap. And so they could print more stuff and they could print it faster. And the third thing is the uh, telegraph wires. Right, they laid a telegraph wire from DC to New York in 1846. And after that, all the political developments in Washington, DC would flash out to abolitionist and partisan newspapers all over the country in a New York minute, as we say. So uh, those changes made a huge difference. So as we as we start to to wrap up here, this half hour goes so fast. I, I mean, and I could talk with you about this for a long time, even though we've already talked about it in our in our more casual walks for a long time. Uh, I, I would like it if you would 
perhaps given that we are in this moment of segueing from the Black History Month to Women's History Month, to share something of your observation about what the women's movement today can learn from these experiences. So much of what you've said has has just resonated with me. And in particular, I mean, there in, in my work with the women's movement, I can tell you that those who hate politics and those who think politics are the only answer, they're still that's still an argument going on. But what can we learn? What's something that we can learn that would help women really move forward in these turbulent times? Scribble, scribble. Okay, the media still matters and getting your message out still matters. Talk and talk. One of the things that the women did in, uh, that the abolitionists did, is they started a lecture corps and they sent the people in person to people's towns and their churches and their lyceum meetings and stuff so that they could directly change their mind. Sometimes they would stay for days and days until they had abolitionized the communities. Talk and talk. Walk and talk. The women in abolition drove the petition movement. So they didn't have the vote, remember? So there was nothing else that they could do. So they mm -hmm. took a leaf from the book of the British suffrage movement. And they had petitions at first to abolish the slave trade in the nation's capital. And they took them to people's kitchen tables. They knocked on their doors, walking the streets of Boston and the little towns of Massachusetts. And they presented the women with the petitions. And in soliciting their signatures, which were meaningful, even though they couldn't vote, they, they converted them. The closest thing that I've seen in the here and now to the petition movement is Stacey Abrams' voter registration campaign. Go door to door and make that connection and then keep going back. And the last thing that I need to say, and this is hard for women who are smaller, weaker, and vulnerable in childbirth and nursing. So it's a hard lesson, but it is the lesson that we need to learn. Don't let them bully you. One of the great turning points in abolition was when um, some very brawny congressman from Ohio, Joshua Reed Giddings, went to Congress. And the first time a Southern congressman came after him with his hand on his pistol, Giddings stood up and looked at the Southerner and said, you talking to me? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, those are, those are crystal clear super important lessons. They fit right in with everything that we talk about in our Take the Lead programs in terms of helping women know the power they actually have. And maybe all, maybe sometimes we don't realize we all have the power to be the media. We all have the power to use our voices. We all have the power to, to, to stand up to, to bullies. So Thank you for that. I mean, there could not have been a more perfect conclusion to this. I, 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 I just, uh, you know, I mean, those are the leadership lessons that we have to learn over and over and over because it's not, it's not inherently known. It's not inherently understood, I think, by anybody how to stand up to a bully. You have to see other people doing it and you have to do it yourself once or twice and realize you don't die. And, and, right. and, and that's a brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening all those years. Uh, thank you. So I, I'm just going to wrap up with one one little vignette here about Linda Hirschman, which is that um, I actually started my book. I actually, Oh, May Bush says, don't let them bully you. Love this. Thank you, May. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm thrilled to, to see that May Bush is, is with us today. Um, so I, uh, I start my book Intentioning with a story, although I didn't name Linda, <laughs> with the story of how I was hiking with a friend and I tripped over some kind of little rock and fell and broke my wrist, having never had a broken bone before. My leadership lesson from that is it's never the mountains that trip you up. It's always the pebbles in your path that you don't see. So, so I'm just adding that little, little, little leadership lesson to the 
brilliant ones that Linda has just taught us and thanking everybody for being with us today. Intentioning this live will come back to you every week, more or less at this time, more or less on Thursday. And uh, next week, Denise Lee, who is a, an incredible entrepreneur and the founder of Alala. You'll find out more about that next week. Uh, Linda Hirschman, thank you so much. Everyone, you must read The Color of Abolition. You will be so enlightened and so glad you did. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda.